So this will be the outline. I will talk about uh, plasmas. Uh, magnetic fields and also the solar wind because uh, this special spacecraft is all about the solar wind. So I would like to make sense how it is generated. Uh, is it because uh, of the sun of its uh, what you call the differential rotation or is it because of, uh, of the magnetic field? So we have so many, we have so many parameters, so many facts so that to make, to make sense of it. That's why we have it. So there are some big questions that uh, this spacecraft uh, hopefully is going to answer for us. So we need to understand these questions once we go through this uh, first part. Uh, then I will talk about the mission concept and also the spacecraft, uh, the spacecraft survival, because uh, as people say, this spacecraft is going to touch the sun. It should be very, very, very close. I'm going to tell you how close it will need to be. I and mean, very close, meaning that uh, the sun is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is not a very hot star, but at least it is about 600 degrees. And if you put your spacecraft very close to it, so you may do some damage to it. So I'd like to talk about it. Uh, spacecraft survival, because it is a very harsh environment. And at the end, some pictures. OK, so this should be, uh, this should be the content of this, uh, of this lecture. So uh, if I may start, maybe my breath is getting a little bit uh, whatever. So this is our star. This is how, this is how the general public uh, knows about the st our, our star, the sun. It's beautiful sunrises. Beautiful sunset, mashallah. Huh? Oh, and the romantics, or whatever. After uh, after 30 years of marriage, uh, what kind of romance you would like to have? Okay, so 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 so, so beautiful. This is how they know. They know the old star as a peaceful star, mashallah, and nothing special about it. But it is uh, it is the one that we have to watch before watching any maybe supernova explosion around us or what. So this is, uh, we need to understand that. Well, because we live, uh, we live uh, within a time where everything depends upon, uh, upon, upon power. How about if we lose that power? Well, if we lose that power, we're going to lose our internet connection. So the whole world will be in big trouble. Uh, we're going to show you that uh, some time ago, something very bad happened. And uh, alhamdulillah, we're alive, but uh, if this, if, if what happened about one century ago will happen again here today, so the cost will be, will be trillions, trillions of, uh, uh, of dollars. So that's why we need to, we need to be careful about, uh, about, uh, about our star. So let me show you a very nice uh, video just to summarize to you, uh, just to give you a, a contrast picture. You saw that beautiful sunrise. So let us show you the real sun. What does it do? 24 hours a day, every week, every month, since more than about 4.6 billion years. This is, what it, this is what it was doing. And it still has enough power to do it for the, for the next five or maybe, maybe six billion years. So let hopefully it will work. You see these beautiful uh, loops of energy, beautiful flare. How active is our star? You can, put your, you can put Earth just as a very small circle here. Look at this huge energy release. You see, the, the main thing today is about this loops. So what you see in front of you, just the sun magnetic field. So how active it is. Uh, most of this energy will fall back, but uh, uh, maybe 10, maybe 15 percent of it will be uh, sent to space, and we receive it sometimes. It will be part of what you call this CME, this coronal mass ejection. Look at this beautiful resolution that you see here. Uh, this is taken by the SDO, Solar Dynamic Observatory, or maybe Orbiter, I don't know, whatever. Look at these beautiful loops. So this is how active is our star. Another beautiful solar prominences. So what you see here, you see plasma and also magnetic field. So whenever we talk about the, our star, the sun, when you talk about plasma, we talk about magnetic field. If we talk about magnetic field, we talk about plasma. This is just a couple of sunspots. We have sunspots only because of one thing. As I said, the sun has this beautiful different rotation. What does it mean? It's not at the level of the equator. The sun uh, makes 26 days to make one full rotation. If you go up to the north, you go up south. 
it will be slower. It may, if you reach the poles, it may, it, the gas there may make one full rotation about only uh, 30 to 35 days. So this is how powerful is our star. So we'd like to understand one thing. So what happens when our star, the sun, sends us these highly charged particles that we call today the solar wind? And how do we know that this solar wind exists? This, uh, I believe, uh, Mercury transit, or Mercury, uh, as it happened, uh, this not uh, two years ago. This must be about uh, in 2012. So this is about how active is our star, the sun. So let me move on. So let me talk about plasmas and magnetic fields and also about solar wind. So what is a plasma? So if you have a gas that is so hot, uh, the, uh, there will be a split between what you call the the charged particles between the, uh, the electrons and also the ions. So what you will have, you have uh, the electrons by themselves and the ions by themselves. So you have a pool, uh, you have a gas uh, having two components. You have the positive ones and negative ones. Uh, a common plasma, uh, you have your the sun. It is, uh, as we say, uh, a sphere of uh, hot plasma. Uh, also, whenever we have lightning, so it is also part of a plasma. Uh, for those people who do construction, so this TIG welding that you see here, it is also plasma. Uh, even neosines, neosines, so, and also fluorescent light. So the energy that you are going to put into your, uh, into, into your neons, so that energy is going to be transferred, uh, is going to ionize the gas and, and that, and, and as, it, as electrons are going to, re to recollect, uh, so uh, it's going to grow. This is what you call a neon. And, uh, uh, and as you know, different colors are from different gases. So we have uh, so, many, so many examples of plasmas around us. But the big one is our star, the sun. And I would like to, uh, to make sense of that. And uh, because it is hot, so uh, plasma have uh, uh, complicated motions. Uh, uh, they have what you call this fluid motion. It's like when you have, let's say, a water waves, so they, so they, so they move. And also uh, electromagnetic uh, motion, well, because this, this, this is charged particles. And because it, it is charged particles, so whenever you have a charged particle moving, so it's going to generate radiation. So you have, uh, you have, you have different types uh, of radiation. So, so it is, it is a complex, so it is fluid motion plus also electro, uh, electromagnetic motion all, uh, all together. So this is what you call the plasma. So, uh, so we, we are interested today, many, many with the, with our star, the sun. So uh, let us talk today about, uh, now about magnetic field. So you are all aware about if I take a, a, a bar magnet and if I throw on it some iron filings. So this is what you will get. I will, you, will, you will get to know, uh, to see exactly. So the, uh, these iron filings are going to get magnetized. And as they're going to get magnetized, so they have to follow the local uh, the local magnetic field. So we are going to, uh, to see in front of you uh, these beautiful shapes. The one that you were seeing uh, when you saw the video uh, for, this, for this beautiful solar prominence, that they have these beautiful loops. Well, these beautiful loops are just magnetic fields. So this is uh, what we define as the magnetic field lines. Uh, and the plasma is the same thing. That's why I said earlier, uh, plasma and the magnetic field are are, are all together. You have plasma. If it is very hot, you have also magnetic field. So, and uh, because it is electrons and ions, so they're going uh, to move. And as they move, they may emit radiation. So they they go to f they have to follow this spiral uh, motion, this helical motion, and also they have to move uh, to move a long way. So so we have uh, usually when it is very 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 relativistic. So. This electron as going to spiral is going to emit a special type of radiation, which we call sacraton radiation. So in a plasma, so these highly charged particles are going uh, to move uh, along. So uh, that's why we say that plasma uh, trace magnetic field lines. As this one, iron field is going to trace magnetic field of a biomagnet. So whenever you see plasma uh, and you see these beautiful loops, it means uh, you have a magnetic field. And whenever you have a magnetic field, Special for the sun, you have you have this plasma. So so they are so they are inter 
they are interconnected between the two. Uh, for our star, it is a little bit uh, weird that is, uh, its its magnetic field flips uh, every every eleven years. Earth magnetic field also flips. What do we mean by by uh, flipping? That the north magnetic pole will become the south magnetic pole, and the south will become so there is like some kind of flipping. So this for the sun, it happens every every eleven years. Meaning that if I start with this configuration. So if this is north, this is uh, south, or north or south. By the way, choosing north and south is just, is just, is just a matter of uh, uh, as with, uh, just uh, uh, how to formulate uh, the direction. So here in this case, uh, we have uh, when the sun has a solar minimum activity because we say the sun has, uh, has two cycles. Uh, the, the one cycle is the sunspot cycle. Every 11 years, the number of sunspots that we see on the surface of the sun is going to change. Uh, by the time of the end of this uh, minimum, so the sun magnetic field is going to flip. So uh, if this is if this is uh, if this is north, uh, the what you call the uh, north. So by the time of the by the time of the uh, end of the first cycle, so this should be south, and this should be uh, this should be north. So there's a flipping every 11 years. If you'd like to have the same the same the same configuration for the magnetic field, you have to wait for two cycles. That's, that's why we say we have the sunspot cycle every 11 years. And we have also the magnetic field cycle every 22 years. So uh, sometimes at maximum, it is a little bit complex. So there's some kind of confusion here for the magnetic field. So it is, it is, it is very distorted. But this is what we can, this is what we can see, this is what we can measure. So there is, there is some kind of, uh, there's some kind of flipping because of, this, uh, of these cycles. Uh, my point is not working here. OK, so how do we know uh, that uh, a solar wind exists because the main the main purpose among uh, among so many ones for the sol for the Parker solar probe is to be able to smell uh, the solar wind. So how do we know that the solar wind exists? Uh, that's uh, that's very very important. Well, comets are uh, are here to tell us uh, to show us a uh, proof that this solar wind exists. Uh, comets inspired questions: Why do comets' tails have structures? What is a comet? It is a frozen body. Uh, it may be one, it may be two, it may be 10, it may be 20, it may be 30 kilometers size wise. It is frozen, uh, made of so many different gases. If it is very far away from the sun, it stays a frozen body. But if it does move toward the uh, inner solar system, it will feel something and it will evaporate. And uh, so, and that evaporation we see. So why does it evaporate? Because, because, because uh, there is some kind of interaction between uh, uh, between uh, this frozen body and also the sun. So why do comet tails have structures? You can see it's a beautiful comet, so it has so many structures here. And also why there are multiple tails visible. And also, and also usually we say that the comet has, uh, has two tails. It has an ion tail made of ions and also a dust tail. So why? Because this frozen body, which is very far away, uh, it says as it is, but as it comes, so uh, that carbon that is uh, inside this uh, frozen body is going to separate and it will form a tail by itself. Usually when you, whenever you look at, uh, at a comet, uh, the ion tail or the gas tail is always straight, straight, and the dust tail is a little bit curved. So we'd like to understand uh, why. And this happens uh, in both ways because the comet is going to follow, let's say, an elliptical orbit. As it is moving inbound, it will have two tails. And also, as it is moving away, it will also have two tails. So we have to explain, we have to explain, we have to explain that. It's not working, so I don't know what's happened to this one. So, uh, it's working? Okay, so in about, uh, in 1943, uh, Ludwig Biermann, he did suggest, uh, maybe because you are close, he did suggest that there's some kind of uh, solar corpuscular radiation coming from the sun. Corps means like particles. Uh, so particles from the sun, as opposed to light only, uh, is going to do what? It's going to interact uh, with, uh, with this frozen body. And because of this interaction, so this, fro this frozen body is going to evaporate. And as it does evaporate, it will form a very nicely tail. So this comet is moving toward the sun inbound. So the tail is always is always opposite the sun direction. It means that there's something pushing uh, this, this, this gas tail uh, away from the sun, and that's something is what gives us some kind of uh, proof 
but it it must be it must be the uh, the solar wind. Uh, double tail, why double tail? As I said, as this uh, frozen body evaporates, so that dust, that carbon is going to separate, but dust doesn't have charge. The only thing that can push that dust is just uh, light. So we have like uh, some uh, like uh, like if you do a solar setting, so we are going to push your spacecraft using just. Uh, uh, the sunlight pressure, so we can push it as far as we can until it will become very, very weak. So this is one of the uh, one of the proof that uh, uh, that uh, that uh, there is something coming from the sun, and this something uh, has to do uh, is 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 responsible uh, for forming these uh, these tails. Uh, also, uh, in September 1850, now this is a very very famous event that happens uh, in September 1859. Uh, this amateur astronomer, Richard Gellington, uh, using his, uh, his private observatory, uh, noticed uh, a white, flare, uh, white light flare coming from a group of suns. But this is his, uh, his drawing with his hand, uh, showing uh, this sample that from this, part, from, this, from this sense part, he noticed that there's some kind of light coming. A couple of days later, the Earth magnetic field responded. And this is a graph showing this from the Q Observatory. This is a magnetograph showing that the Earth magnetic field has been affected because of what happened a couple of days ago. So he wanted to make a connection, but what he saw as a white light coming from this group of sunspots, and what happened later on Earth, meaning that the sun has to do something with it, because we are in 1859. And also, uh, this event resulted in what you call the largest geo-effective uh, storm that Earth has ever uh, seen. Uh, aurora were as bright as day, so some people, uh, they were camping in the Rocky Mountain in the US, and uh, uh, suddenly, uh, night became daylight, and they thought it's, it is time to prepare breakfast, because it was daylight. Uh, auroras were as, as low as Panama, if I may talk a little bit about aura, usually we say that this aura always happens around the polar uh, ice caps. Uh, so they, they may be, they, they are best seen above 60.5 uh, 60, 60, 60, 60 north and also 60.5 south. But this is Panama. It is uh, very, very, very close uh, to the equator. So, uh, so why did it happen? Uh, telegraphs, we are in 1859. Uh, I believe we are... Uh, we are of a generation that uh, may not have uh, used a telegraph. Usually, uh, in the in the 17th, in the in the, uh, in the 19th century, so the telegraph was the mean of sending any message. And today, we have, uh, uh, as we always we say, we have the Zata.com, so they can use it to have to have everything at. So, but during those time, they have to rely on these long conductors. Uh, it is a wire, so it is subject to induce currents. So, some of these uh, telegraphs are. Uh, they fail, they catch fire, and also some of them, they did operate without using any power because they have received enough power from the sun. So because of all what happens days after what uh, Carrington has saw uh, as a white flare, so he was able to connect between this solar activity and also with, with what happened on Earth. So what carries the solar influence to the Earth? Light is too fast. What do you mean by light is too fast? Well, this event happened, uh, I believe it was September 1, uh, 1859. They saw it uh, uh, days later. If it, if it were because of light, light had the speed of light. Uh, we receive uh, light from the sun just after about eight minutes. So if it were, if it, if it were because of light, uh, right away. But no, it took a couple of days. It means there's something moving, some kind of particles moving, not at the speed of light. Uh, so uh, that's why, uh, so he wanted to make a connection between what happened to the sun and also to what happened on Earth. And that's what, that was uh, the beginning, the beginning of understanding this, this, this solar wind. Okay, so I don't know if, I'm, if I skipped uh, a slide. Okay, I'm good. Okay, uh, came uh, Eugene Parker. Look at the name Eugene Parker. Just to give you a flair why this, why this solar probe was named Parker, it, it was after this, uh, this American scholar, an astrophysicist specialized in the sun. Uh, 
He's under retirement. He's still alive. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so Eugen Parker, uh, as we see today, that's why this, this pesca was named after him. He, he, he was the one to put uh, the foundation of the solar wind to make sure that any, all what we see on Earth as activities, uh, which, we, which today we refer to as space weather, by the way, is because, is because of the solar wind. So uh, in terms of the solar atmosphere, it is hot and dense. So this is, uh, when, I, when, I, when I say about hot and dense, usually the solar atmosphere is made of that, uh, uh, of that, of that chromosphere. So we have the photosphere, the visible surface of the sun, about 6,000 degrees. We go upward, uh, we, have the, uh, we have the chromosphere, about 10,000 degrees. And we go beyond that, we have the corona about one to three million degrees. Usually you may expect as you move away from the uh, heat source, which is uh, the sun center, the temperature should decrease. This is physics. You go from high to low. But uh, what is strange that as we move uh, uh, further from the, sun co uh, from the sun surface, the temperature increases. Uh, it, is, it is another lecture, so, so I'm not going to talk about it a lot. But this is what we see. So that's why we are saying, we are saying here that, uh, that, that the solar atmosphere is hot. Okay. Uh, it is about one to three million degrees. Uh, for the gas beyond the sun, which is what you call the interstellar uh, medium between stars, it is not, it is not hot. It is uh, cool and also sparse. Uh, what do you mean by sparse? The density field, uh, usually we say that the average density between the two stars is about only one particle. Uh, per centimeter cube. Uh, at sea level, the density is about 10 to, 10 to 29. So one particle per centimeter cube, this is ultra, ultra vacuum, so, it is no, so there's nothing. So uh, using, using, uh, using physics, uh, or not just physics, using what you call the momentum conservation, using max flux conservation, using the idea gas law that would like to link uh, uh, pressure to temperature to density, what well, Eugene was able to work out a model a model for this, uh, for this solar wind. Why does it, why does it exist? So uh, uh, he, he found the end that the motion of particles in the solar atmosphere is a balance between uh, gas temperature and also gravitational force. So you have all of these uh, particles being emitted by the sun in that very hot environment. The sun, as far as we tell, we can tell within the solar system is a big, is a big object, 99.8% of the mass of the whole solar system, the mass of the sun. So it has enough gravity uh, to hold uh, these uh, particles. But it is also very, very hot. So you have like a balance between how hot it is and also how strong is the gravity. Uh, just to explain why do we have such a nice atmosphere around us? Well, because we have the right mass uh, to hold enough particles around us. If we're a little bit uh, uh, smaller, we're going to lose, uh, we're going to lose our uh, uh, to lose our uh, atmosphere. It all, it, 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 it all uh, has to do with what's called the escape speed. So, so the hotter particles, because they are hot, they can overcome. They can overcome the gravitational force and they can escape. And if they can escape, so we'd like to know how do they do that. Okay. Uh, if, 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 if you didn't like uh, what I said here, of uh, this beautiful balance, maybe you can understand it here as equations. Maybe it is Chinese. We move on. This ex that sentence that, uh, that you show is exactly those equations, especially the last one. The balance between, if I may see it, because we have a, a student from the, from the physics department. So this balance between what you call the, the solar wind accelera uh, acceleration, the speed of sound, and also gravity. So this is the, the main equation that does uh, govern that uh, highly charged particles as it leaves the surface of the sun. So because of this, that gas, that gas particle uh, can escape. Another guy, uh, about 50 years before, uh, before, uh, uh, before uh, Parker, uh, he demonstrated the, the magnetic structure of sunspot using the Zeeman effect. Usually we say that the sunspot uh, is, a, is, a, is a magnetic field activation. Or uh, whenever you see a sunspot, usually it is not a single spot, it is two spots. But because it shows a magnetic field, and the magnetic field has always uh, north and south. Uh, and because it is under very, very hot, uh, very hot environment, 
So any line coming from the sun will be split into two. This is what you call the, the Zeeman effect. So uh, Eugene Parker uh, took uh, care of this, uh, of this notion that, that these sunspots uh, have, magnetic, uh, have, have a magnetic field embedded into them. And it came up uh, in terms of a way how to explain this uh, release of charged particles. Let's say if there is a charged particle coming uh, from this point, so radially it will move away from the sun, but the sun is not fixed. The sun rotates around itself. So as it does rotate, so this part is going to move outward. There's another one is going to move, another one. So each of these, uh, what we call blob of energy release from the sun has a magnetic field and they are connected by a magnetic field line. So this, where this uh, beautiful, uh, what we call it, uh, we call it uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Parker spiral, but uh, all of the particles that are released, they will form beautiful spiral patterns uh, as they move away. So, and it has been, it ha and it has been also observed. That's one big triumph for, uh, for, uh, for Parker because he was able to predict uh, this beautiful spiral arms of the magnetic field, and this is exactly what we see. So, uh, solar wind does exist. Uh, this is, uh, uh, the sun surface, let's say uh, r equal to uh, whatever, this equal to zero. I we going to see how, as the sun be, is, being, is, is going to become active, how it's going to emit these very shiny, uh, charged high particles, and how we're going to, rec uh, to receive them. This is, uh, this is the, uh, the location of uh, Venus, and this is the location of Earth. Uh, the spacecraft has been sent in the, in the late uh, 2000. Uh, uh, five or six, called the wind spacecraft. It has uh, it ha it had a, a special device to measure, to measure uh, uh, what you call the the wind density. Uh, so the sun is going to now. So this uh, video is going to show us how this stream of particles, which we call sometimes we call uh, CMEs, uh, coronal mass ejection, how they are going to propagate and how we're going to see them. So we're going to see. A, Effectively, but these highly charged particles called the solar wind exist. So let me just turn the video on. A very beautiful video. You can see it. So there's three particles coming. And what we see, we see the density. And this is a logarithmic scale. Look at the high concentration of highly charged particles as being detected by this wind spacecraft. Look at the, uh, like, like it is an accelerometer. So I'm going to increase the speed of these highly charged particles. And look also at the scale. Look how big it is. So this is uh, just uh, what we call the visual uh, representation of this, uh, of this uh, uh, solar wind. Okay, uh, there are two types of solar wind. There's a fast and also slow. Because they come from different regions, we have the fast, uh, I'm sorry, I, to, I said uh, I typed it very fast, this is fat. It is not fat, it's fast. So fast solar wind, uh, it is super, super sonic. It is very, very fast. Uh, it is usually asso associated with, with what you call coronal holes. Uh, what are these coronal holes? Uh, when we take an X-ray map of the sun, especially when I say an X-ray map, it means that we are looking at the hot corona. Sometimes we see uh, we see nothing. We see black regions. So these black regions are what you call coronal holes, and we believe that from this black region, from these coronal holes, this fast uh, solar wind uh, uh, escape the sun. And uh, they can be, they can be, they, be they, uh, they are quite close to the sun, about one, two, three times the sun radius. So this is what, this is what, uh, what, uh, what we are seeing here. So this is a map of uh, showing just only a scale uh, in terms of speed in, 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 different, uh, in different regions. Uh, for the slow wind, it comes uh, mostly around, around the equator, the sun equator. It is about 250 to 500. Um, and uh, it can be seen a little bit far away, up to about 20 times the sun radius. So they can, they can move outward and uh, deep, uh, deep into, uh, 
uh, deep into uh, the, uh, the interstellar medium. So, so we have two types of, uh, so we need to explain also, uh, also that. So the, the Parker solar probe has to explain uh, what makes this difference between the two and why, uh, why does the, 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 the fast uh, comes, uh, comes uh, the, uh, the fast solar wind uh, comes from regions uh, other than the equator. Uh, in terms of mode observation of the solar wind, we have uh, sent an armada of uh, spacecrafts uh, for different purposes. Some of them just to study our own magnetosphere, and some of them like SOHO, like stereo, uh, to study uh, the sun directly. So uh, we have been uh, able to observe uh, the sun radiation from radio to gamma rays. Uh, in terms of electric fields, we have what's called radio bursts. I won't talk about it today. Uh, in terms of magnetic fields, we're able to as, at least uh, measure the solar wind field, uh, that it is not continuous. It does represent some kind of shocks sometimes. Uh, we are able also to measure uh, the density, uh, the velocity, temperature. So uh, species, if you, may, if, you, if, if, if you have asked me, uh, this solar wind is made of what kind of particles? Uh, it is mostly protons. Uh, we have some electrons. 10 to 50% is helium. The other whatever is uh, are, uh, any particle uh, or any chemical element you may think of. So it is a measure, but it is uh, in very low percentage. So mostly it, is, mostly it is protons. And also we have some spacecraft to study our own, our own magnetosphere, our own ionosphere, uh, Earth impacts of so activity and so on. So this is, what, this is exactly the new trend today is to, is to, is to be able to, uh, to link uh, what happens on the sun uh, to what happened on Earth. That's why I said earlier we have what you called uh, this uh, space weather. Uh, for sure, as discussed here, we have the space weather and also the, the atmosphere. So there are big questions to be answered. Uh, I have listed here a few of them. Uh, it has been about 159 years uh, since Garrington uh, demonstrated that there is some kind of Sun-Earth connection. There is no doubt about it that we are connected to the Sun because of what is as activities. Uh, 60 years after Parker was able to prove that the solar wind does exist, he was able to show uh, this beautiful uh, Parker spiral. Uh, we had about 20 NASA missions just to study our star of the sun. Look how, um, how important it is. After all of this, we still have some unanswered questions. We'd like to make sense of them. The first one, what hits and also accelerate the solar wind. So these highly charged particles, when they move, how, what is the process that hits them to such high speed? And also, uh, what, can, uh, what sort of structure are the sources of the solar wind? Because uh, we see so many activities, so many storms. And also, how are solar energetic particles accelerated? So we need to make, we need to answer all of these questions. Uh, as I said, we have sent all of this uh, spacecraft. You may say, uh, isn't it enough? Well, uh, it is enough if you would like to study the general questions, but if you would like to uh, study the source, the source of all what we see on, on Earth in terms of activities, you have to be very, very, very close to the sun. And this is the role of the Parker Solar Probe. It, we have to get as close as possible to see exactly before, before, before the information is lost. What? Because I said, remember, that, uh, that these uh, solar wind uh, particles are supersonic. What does it mean, supersonic? Meaning, once they leave the sun, we lose information about, about the sun. That's why we need to be very close to the sun to be able to get that information before it is, it is lost into space. That's why we have to, we have to, be, we have to be. So, so uh, the, the Parker Solar Probe was designed to answer, hopefully, hopefully these questions, if everything, if everything goes well, because it is going to, as we say, it's going to touch the sun. So let me talk now about uh, the spacecraft design. Yes, the listener or is going to change to sense or so, 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 yes. Uh, well, first of all, it has uh, 
this very important uh, heat shield. It is good and bad at the same time for the spacecraft, as I'm going to explain in a few minutes. It is the one that has to protect the, the uh, sun instruments or of that heat because it will be at a distance that it will feel about 1500, 1500 degrees. So anything can melt down. So we have to have a special uh, heat sheet for that. Uh, it has solar panels. You may ask yourself if it's going to be very close to the sun. These solar panels, if they're going to be very close, what will happen to them? So they have to uh, find a way to protect them. Uh, you have to cool the instrument from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the heat shield. There will be a lot of heat uh, uh, behind. So you have to cool this, what you call the radiators. Believe it or not, this spacecraft is cooled using water. It has a water pump, like the one that you have in your car for water to circulate. Water, yes. It works like a refrigerator, exactly. And you have the antenna to make, uh, to exchange data. You have uh, so many sensors. So you have the eighty feet sensor, the ninety feet sensors, uh, they, like this one, they are behind. So uh, they were asked, uh, what will happen to this, uh, uh, to this, to this bar? So, when it does uh, feel the, the sun heat. So will it glow? Yes, it will glow. If it does glow, it will emit also radiation. So, so this is the overall design of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the spacecraft. Now, how will it be close? Well, this is a very nice scale. This is the location of the sun. And this is Earth. It is given in terms of uh, the sun radius. Uh, the sun radius is about uh, 700,000 kilometers. To scale, this is the orbit of uh, uh, Mercury. This is the orbit of Venus. This is uh, how close we were in 1976. But these two spacecraft, Helios 1 and Helios 2, Helios 1 and Helios 2 were built by West Germany when it was West Germany. Parker will be here. Look how close it will be at about 9.8 solar radius. 9.8, sorry, this is about uh, only 6 million kilometers. We are 150 million kilometers from, uh, from, uh, from the sun. The SOHO spacecraft just above our heads. So this one will be 6 million kilometers. Very, very close. That's why it's going to touch, to smell, to do whatever. So it has, it has, it, it has to survive. Uh, that's why so uh, people are a little, are little bit skeptical. Uh, is it going to make it or not? Why? Because uh, there are so many uh, challenges on its way. First of all, you have to make sure that it will arrive to the sun. Uh, usually, you, when you are asked by kids, and how do you send a rocket to the moon? Directly. <laughs> we don't send a rocket directly to, to anything because we don't have enough, uh, uh, that rocket doesn't have enough power uh, to take your space out to that. So we get to use gravity assist. So we get to help. Uh, the original plan for, for, for the Parker Solar Probe was to send it to Jupiter and to use the angular momentum of Jupiter to, to shoot it toward the sun. But it was thought too risky. So uh, the spacecraft, uh, it has been launched uh, this past August. So it's going to do what? It's going to use uh, uh, Venus as an assist. So th there will be about 24 orbits. For every orbit, it will get closer and closer. The first orbit, it will be at about 35, uh, 35 uh, sun radius from the sun. And that's a challenge, right? Because as, as you send your spacecraft toward the sun in any of these orbits, you have to make sure that this instrument will not burn down. That's why as the spacecraft is moving toward the sun, well, the, the heat shield is always pointed toward the sun. So if it comes like this, then it has to turn, to turn, to turn. So all the time you have to guide it for it not 
to expose the instruments. So at all time in its orbit, the heat shield is always facing, uh, facing the sun. And by the way, I forgot something about, uh, I showed something very important to this uh, in the previous slide. I showed uh, th uh, this one. I showed this uh, uh, white light imager. So this always pointing 90 degrees away from the sun. It can never see the sun directly. The antenna, it can see. Uh, the sensors can see. But this is always 90 degrees. If you point to the sun, you are going to burn it. So let me return to my slide. So, uh, the launch date was in between this one, this, 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 this the, what you call the open window. It was launched, uh, I believe, October, uh, August, August 12. Uh, the trajectory 24 orbits, seven Venus gravity assist. So every time it will go around Venus, it will bring it closer and closer and closer. Uh, this is just some information about uh, the first perihelion. So this is how close it will be in the, after the first orbit that you become closer until the final solar orbit. So it will be about uh, uh, 9.8, affiliance 0.73 AU, uh, how, uh, how inclined it is, and also the orbital period. So it is, it, it is meant to survive six years and 11 months into space. So uh, if, any, if, nothing, uh, if nothing wrong happened. Now, how about the survivor? That's very important. So uh, the heat shield and the antennas are going to, they have to sustain this temperature. It must point right. If there is an error of two degrees of this heat shield not pointing toward the sun, so the instrument will burn out. So more than two degrees, you have lost your spacecraft. Uh, we have to uh, we have to uh, uh, to to keep the uh, uh, the uh, the spacecraft safe in terms of heat. So we we need to uh, uh, to use this heat shield. But when uh, the heat shield when the uh, spacecraft is very far away from the sun, we don't want this heat shield to uh, to, to to shield anything because it will be too cold for the spacecraft. Also, the antenna uh, and the particle sensors are always in full sunlight because these are the ones that make the measurements. We need to, uh, them to be exposed. Uh, in terms of radiation, so we get to be very close to the sun, so there will be a high, high, high amount of energy uh, reaching the, the instruments. Uh, and this can be very dangerous for the, for the spacecraft uh, uh, electronics. Uh, for the impact, this will be uh, the Parker Solar uh, probe is the first one to have uh, very, very high speed. So it, it, was, it is the first spacecraft to have such a speed. Uh, the, uh, the second one was the New Horizon spacecraft that was sent to Pluto. It had a speed of about 60 kilometers per second, so this three times. So this is the fastest spacecraft that has ever been built. Uh, also, we have to worry about dust impact that exists around the sun uh, at this high speed. Even if it is a micro whatever, it may ruin your uh, your heat shield, it may also ruin your cooling system. It is made, as I said, it has a radiator field of water. If any of these uh, uh, dust particles uh, hit the radiator, so you have a leak of water and you cannot cool down your system. And also you have to uh, be careful uh, of the solar rays. So if, uh, in terms of the solar rays, I forgot to tell you about it, uh, they are expandable. When the spacecraft is very close uh, to the sun, they close them. When it is far away from the sun, they open them. So they will try to get as much as energy when the spacecraft is a little bit away from the sun. Otherwise, uh, the solar panels are going to burn. So they have to do this, uh, this game, so they have to open them, they have to close them. Uh, this is what I'm saying here. Uh, the lifetime is about six plus years. So if all of this survival kit is, uh, is positive, nothing happened here and there and there and there, so your spacecraft is going to survive at least, at least six years. In terms of pictures, this is uh, the uh, probe when it was built. This is how big is the heat shield. Uh, it was built at different locations. This is when they were putting uh, the, uh, the heat shield. 
I believe it is about uh, uh, three meters. Three meters tall. Okay, so let me summarize. Uh, the Parker Solar Probe is unique in its mission because it will be the only one that will be so close to our star. Hopefully it will answer all these uh, big questions. It was carefully engineered to sustain all the heat and also to meet the science goals. It is on its way uh, since more than about uh, a month and a half. And I believe uh, by... Uh, uh, by the end of November, so we're going to re receive the first batch of data. So I want to be very close at about 36 uh, uh, sun radii, and hopefully it will survive until 2025. This is uh, a rock, uh, showing the rocket uh, used, it was Delta IV rocket at Cape Canaveral. And this is uh, Gene Parker. So he's still alive, and uh, for him it was uh, like, uh, a big recognition because he was the one who uh, who uh, who gave the what you call the, the theory behind the uh, the solar wind. So just to recognize his contribution, so the whole spacecraft was him. Usually we name things we name spacecraft after people die, but this one is still alive. So for him it was a it was a very big honor to have it. Uh, hopefully it will sustain. Until, until uh, or I mean, he will stay alive until 2025. Thank you very much.